The infraclavicular brachial plexus block is an extremely effective and reliable technique for anesthetizing the upper limb. It's a favorite of many longtime regionalists, and in this video, we'll discuss the anatomy, sonoanatomy, and the technique for blocking the brachial plexus in the infraclavicular fossa. If we consider the region just south of the clavicle and medial to the coracoid process, we see that the brachial plexus forms three cords that lie in close proximity to the axillary artery. They're named for their relation to the artery, and so we have the lateral cord, the posterior cord, and the medial cord. Their intimate relation with the artery means that the infraclavicular is essentially a perivascular technique. To effectively visualize and block the plexus, we'll want the patient supine, with the head of the bed slightly elevated. The head is turned to the contralateral side, and the arm is abducted to 90 degrees. The operator can approach the patient from the ipsilateral side or from the head of the bed, depending on ergonomics and the location of the ultrasound machine. The transducer is placed in a parasagittal orientation, just caudad to the clavicle and just medial to the coracoid process. These two structures are in green here. This should get you an image like this. Here we see the pec major and minor muscles, and beneath those are the axillary artery and vein. The artery is going to be our main focus. Clustered around the artery are the three cords, the lateral and posterior typically on the cephalad side, and the medial wedged between the artery and the vein. The goal of the block is to advance a needle from the cephalad aspect through the pec muscles and land the needle tip just deep to the artery at the 6 o'clock position. Things are clustered tightly here, and you'll want to make good use of hydrodissection to keep those cords clear of the needle path. And it's often the case that you can see your artery well, but don't have a clear image of any of the cords. The great thing about this block is it doesn't matter. If you put your local at 6 o'clock, you'll be in great shape. We'll typically use between 20 and 30 mils of local, depending on the patient's size and the pattern of spread. Here's an example of why it's not crucial to see the cords. I can maybe see the lateral cord in this image, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. That's okay, because my goal is to hit that 6 o'clock spot. You can see the local lifting the artery up and spreading in a U-shaped pattern. This is what you want to see. Okay, so here we see the axillary artery underneath the pec minor muscle. We can appreciate what looks like the lateral cord on the cephalad side. The needle passes through the pec major and pec minor muscles, and hydrodissection lifts the pec fascia off the artery. We want to scrape the paint off the artery, passing very close to it tangentially while we continue to hydrodissect. There, the needle tip is deep to the artery and we get immediate flow after passing through that fascia layer. Our aim is to see local anesthetic directly underneath the artery with no intervening structures or layers. Like the supraclavicular, this is a spinal of the arm, meaning you block nearly the entire upper limb, with one caveat. At this location, you don't reliably get the suprascapular nerve, which branches off the superior trunk. And for that reason, the infraclavicular approach is not ideal for shoulder surgery. Everything else is fair game though, arm, elbow, forearm, and hand. The infraclavicular approach is a favorite of many for one principal reason. It's a single injection, one and done. If you put 30 mils of local anesthetic immediately deep to the artery, you have a 100.0% success rate, or at least very close. This is because you only have three cords and they all lie in the same neurovascular plane as the artery. The supraclavicular brachial plexus block, by comparison, tends to fail occasionally with a single corner pocket injection and it often requires two or even three separate needle passes and aliquots of local anesthetic to get a good effect. The other plus relates to catheters. Because the catheter is going through two fairly thick muscles, it holds well and doesn't move compared to a supraclavicular location where the plexus is shallow and the patient's neck is moving constantly. The chest wall is also a more comfortable place to have a catheter dressing compared to the neck. Here are some infraclavicular tips. First, there are a lot of vessels in this part of the body, so watch for where your needle travels. The two that are most at risk are the thoracoacromial artery, or its branches, and the cephalic vein. These typically lie in the plane between the two pec muscles, so it's a good idea to check for them before planning your needle trajectory. Second, it's a common novice error to inadvertently let the probe slide medial or lateral, making it challenging to find your landmarks. As long as you keep the narrow pec minor muscle on the screen, you should be in good shape. Here's our nice view. When the probe slides medial, we lose pec minor and end up very close to the chest wall. Going the other way, we pass by our optimal view and then end up losing the artery as we begin to see more deltoid and shoulder structures. 
keeping both pec muscles on the screen anchors your image in the right place. And lastly, a criticism of the infraclavicular approach is that it's relatively steep and deep, which makes it difficult to see the needle at times. Heel towing the probe so the beam is angled more towards the head may only change the angle by 10 to 15 degrees, but this vastly improves the likelihood you'll see your needle. Alternatively, we'll pull out the curvilinear probe sometimes, especially for patients with a lot of pec muscle. The fan-shaped angle of the beam can improve needle visualization, especially in heavy patients. And finally, the retroclavicular or raptor approach can provide excellent needle visualization due to the flattened trajectory. For an in-depth discussion of the raptor, check out this video.